Chapter 91 Boards and Veils Exodus chapter 26 verses 15 to 37 And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of shittim wood, standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one board. Two tenons, hands, shall there be in one board, set in order one against the another. Thus shalt thou make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards on the south side southward. And thou shalt make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side there shall be twenty boards, and the forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And for the sides of the tabernacle westwards thou shalt make six boards, and two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in the two sides. And they shall be coupled together beneath, and they shall be coupled together above the head of it under one ring, thus shall it be for them both, they shall be for the two corners. And they shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And thou shalt make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle, for the two sides westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the boards shall reach from end to end. And thou shalt overlay the boards with gold, and make them rings of gold for places for the bars. And thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which was showed thee in the mount. And thou shalt make a veil of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twisted linen of cunning work, with cherubims it shall be made. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold, and hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tashes, that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table without the veil, and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and thou shalt put the table on the north side. And thou shalt make an hanging for the door of the tents of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twisted linen, wrought with needlework. And thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and their hooks shall be of gold, and thou shalt cast five sockets of brass for them. Exodus chapter 26, verses 15 to 17. We are now told that this royal tent is to be supported by an extensive wooden framework which is overlaid with gold. We are not told what the thickness of the boards was, although some have surmised that they were a cubit thick and were therefore true pillars. It has also been assumed that each pillar may have been made of several boards put together to make a solid pillar. The word for veil, the Hebrew word Paraketh means that which shuts off. The Acacia Woods, or Shittim, is a member of the Mimosa family. It is a light and hardy wood and, where plentiful, is very useful for building purposes. The boards were joined together by tenons set in silver sockets. The construction was such as to make the tabernacle easy to dismantle for the purpose of moving, and yet it was also designed for magnificence and glory. 
The frame construction, however, indicates that the tabernacle pointed ahead to a temple. It was built in a fashion which suggests a step towards a permanent dwelling. The veil separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place, and the veil had embroidered upon it the depiction of the cherubim. The veil for the door was embroidered with needlework, but the design is not here stated. There was thus a veil to the holy place and the holy of holies. We have a very important statement in verse 30. God tells Moses that the tabernacle is to be erected according to a pattern given by God on Mount Sinai. This at once gives an added dimension to the tabernacle. According to Hebrews chapter 9 verses 1 to 12, the tabernacle is a type of heaven. The cherubim typified the heavenly choir which cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3 The veil sets forth the separation between man and God. The Holy of Holies witnesses to the inaccessible nature of God in his being. The holy place, where continual worship was offered to God, represents the church militant, a power from the throne at work in the world. George Rawlinson called attention to the significance of the tabernacle's inner royal splendour and its plainer exterior. Those who looked on the tabernacle from without saw the goat's hair and the ram's skin and seal skins and perceived in it no beauty that they should desire it. The beauty was revealed to those only who were within. So now the church is despised and vilified by those without valued as it deserves only by those who dwell in it. Again, the structure seems weak, as does the structure of the church to worldlings. A few boards, an awning, a curtain or two. What more frail and perishable. But when all is fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16, when, by a machinery of rings and bars and tenons and solid sockets and pillars and hooks, the whole is wedded into one under divine direction and contrivance, the fragility disappears. God's strength is made perfect in weakness. A structure is produced which continues, which withstands decay, which defies assaults from without, which outlasts others seemingly far stronger and bids fair to remain when all else is shattered and destroyed. Behold, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. The tabernacle, frail as it was, lasted from the Exodus until the time when Solomon expanded it into the temple. Our tabernacle, the church, will endure until it shall please God to merge it in a new and wonderful creation. The New Jerusalem, Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, verses 10 to 27, chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. The Bible does speak of the typical meaning of the tabernacle. Like so much else, the tabernacle pointed beyond itself. At the same time, its local and particular meaning must not be forgotten. Of this, A. B. Davidson commented, The tabernacle, before coming to anything deeper than mere material elements and locality, was the centre and seat of the Jewish theocracy. It was, of course, a thing just as real as the land of Canaan or the nation of Israel. The theocracy was a kingdom of which God was the king, and the tabernacle was his palace or abode. The kingdom was visible, so was the palace, so was at least the presence of the king. There the people had audience with the monarch, thence he issued commands in a way recognisable by the senses for their guidance. The tabernacle was thus a real thing of the same quality as the land of Canaan and the Israelitish nation. The entrance to the tabernacle was on the east, and there the five pillars overlaid with gold were at the doorway. 
The sockets of bases at the bottom of each of the boards were of silver. These were used to plant the framework into the ground. Each socket or base weighed a talent, according to Exodus chapter 38, verse 27, which means about 94 pounds. Not only Exodus, but also Ezekiel, shows that architecture is very important to God. In the history of Christendom, we have seen a conflict between Neoplatonism and biblical faith. The conflict has been waged on a number of fronts, and at the same time, their fusion has also been commonplace. Platonism and Neoplatonism divide reality into two ultimate substances, form or ideas, mind, spirit and matter. The two are in unhappy fusion, and for the Neoplatonists, the spiritual man or the true philosopher separates himself from and even despises matter in favour of spirit. For some Greco-Romans this meant a low regard for the body, for family life, for buildings, for clothing, or for anything else that stressed the material side of life. Asceticism has deeply Neoplatonic and Far Eastern philosophical roots. Within Christendom, this kind of thinking has led to ascetic flights from the world, a contempt of material practicality, various socialist movements and an anti-capitalist mentality. A concern for productivity and material advance is seen by such people as materialism and hence bad. Such a perspective is anti-Christian. Scripture declares that God created all things very good, Genesis chapter 1 verse 31, so that things material and things spiritual are equally the good gifts of God. With the fall, both are fallen. However, God's purpose in Christ is the total redemption of all things. The resurrection of the body forbids us to despise the material realm. God's redemption of all things, every sphere of our lives, is ordained. Architecture is thus a Christian concern. God himself saw fit to give Moses a building plan. Buildings are tools for living, working, worshipping and rejoicing, and they are not to be despised. In ages of vitality, Christians have made major contributions to architecture. Consider, for example, the Enlightenment versus the Puritan view of home construction. The Enlightenment led to palace building, as with Versailles, to furnishings and rooms designed for display and pride, not for comfort. The Puritans in New England eventually designed houses meant for comfortable living. Eric Sloan has shown how detailed their knowledge was of wood, location, air circulation and more. Christian architects are needed now to design houses for the various climates and for man's maximum utility in living. It is interesting that Quinlan Terry, a prominent English architect, born into an atheist family, has concluded from his studies that classical architecture represents a borrowing from the temple design of scripture. Architecture is very important in the Bible, as are writing and singing for that matter. Very clearly to underrate the importance of buildings in all areas of our lives has no warrant in scripture. The God who provided Moses with building plans on Mount Sinai clearly requires us to take all aspects of construction seriously. What we have in these verses is a written form of a building blueprint. It is necessary for us to recognise how much space God gives to his building plans. These are a part of his word, not only to Moses and the Israel of Moses' day, but also to us. They require us to recognise how seriously God takes building plans and the material side of life. To despise architecture and the material aspects of our lives is to despise God. 
no small amount of scripture is given to the construction of the tabernacle, the temple, and the furnishings thereof. It is a false and ungodly spirituality to assume that the construction and quality of homes, and especially churches, is a matter of indifference to our God 